help me think of whenever people say, well, why don't we use the guard for usually for fucking law enforcement? I'm like, there are really good reasons. <laughs> oh, <boy. laughs> it's uh, 5.30. So we And uh, we'll start out with reviewing the agenda. And I do have a request if somebody yeah. would uh, would make the motion. I would like to move the chief's report um, up to uh, 550 uh, between uh, after the review and approval. So moved. Second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and so then uh, we'll have public comments, commissioner comments, we'll review and approve the minutes, uh, then we'll have the chief report, and we have Captain Mason filling in for the chief tonight to do that, he's had to do another appointment, uh, and then we'll go over, continue to go over the policy, uh, code of conduct uh, with Sergeant Williams, and then we'll talk about the retreat, and we'll have a handout, that's always exciting. <laughs> and uh, there will have closing comments, and so hopefully we'll be out of here at 8 o'clock. Um, and we do have um, a guest tonight. Uh, Lori is filling in for Steve from yeah. the Civilian uh, Review Board tonight. So we have uh, comments on that. So with that, I will turn it over to Edward for public comments. And that I'll be turning the blue slip for public comment. This is your moment. Mm -hmm. Table over there, and our first commenter is Mr. Jay Tindall. Okay, Phil Tindall. Saturday at the retreat, I stated homelessness and violent protest are the two main issues facing police. 30 minutes later, Chief Kearns arrived and said that homelessness and protests were his top two concerns. Is this the only time this has happened? No. Capitalizing on my absence prior to uh, Bob's attempt, my single absence prior to Bob's attempted public shaming fiasco, Bob and Tammy stacked the homeless panel to remove discussion of practical solutions. We know people want home, the homeless off the streets and out of the parks. I get it. But throwing police at the homeless was, has not worked. The unhoused are still there. Their numbers are growing. Insanity is repeating the same behavior while expecting a different outcome. Also on Saturday, little Bobby repeated his drugs are the problems tirade. I understand Bob may have trouble wrapping his tiny little mind around the fact that drugs are a symptom of the problem, not the cause of the problem. Just as punishing the homeless will not end homelessness, punishing drug abusers will not end drug addiction. Let me try to avoid triggering the you don't want us to enforce the law reaction. If a homeless person, drug addict, or violent protester commits a crime, hold them accountable. However, for example, if you give a homeless kid a jaywalking ticket, then the principle of equality under the law demands you also ticket the person in a business suit who commits the same crime. This commission is not about, in Bob's words, making sure we give the police the tools to do the job. Bob's attitude is problematic in many ways. Under Bob and Tammy shutting discussion down, this commission made itself irrelevant. I have seven months of video demonstrating a pathetic waste of resources. If you fail to get your act together, I will insert commentary and put this on community television. Your work is double, uh, sorry, drug addiction, homelessness, and violent protests are symptoms of other problems. Gain perspective on this, then you can help the police chart a better course. Your work is doubly difficult because beliefs are being shaped right and left by ideologically driven mainstream fake news. Live stream YouTube videos demonstrate that the New York Times, as well as Fox News, lie consistently to shape a narrative. Brexit and Trump were the first major pushback on the ongoing war to destroy free speech. Violent anti-free speech protest is coming to Eugene. This commission can serve uh, by helping EPD to think this through in advance. Thank you. That's it for public comment, apparently. 
Certainly. Um, no, aside from uh, saying that the um, dinner that we had last night at Women's Space uh, to celebrate that was a really nice affair and it was um, well received. I think they raised a lot of money and so it was, uh, it was very nice. And uh, I thought Saturday's meeting was very productive. Um, thanks. I have three comments that I'll make very briefly. Uh, the first one is that the Human Rights Commission would like to invite all of you to attend uh, tomorrow night at 5.30 at Temple Beth Israel, a discussion on white supremacy's growth uh, in the United States and in the Eugene Springfield area. Um, and also would like to thank EPD, who is providing some additional resources to ensure the safety of attendees at that event. Um, the speaker who is there has spoken multiple times across the country on this issue and has at times generated violent threats. And so EPD's participation in this event is greatly appreciated. Um, also from the Human Rights Commission, we'd like to thank EPD for their rapid apprehension of the mosque vandalism suspect. Uh, we thought that that was, you know, well, these crimes continue to happen and we continue to work on those and tracking them, which is good. The rapid apprehension is important for showing that this is a community that does not tolerate that kind of behavior. Um, the last thing I'll bring up is more personal for me than it is from the HRC, so I want to be clear about that. that um, Recently downtown, there was an instance where a number of young people were engaged in some sort of altercation. EPD arrived. Um, there was insufficient resources for EPD, and the crowd turned against the officers. An innocent bystander stepped in to attempt to help calm the crowd. After EPD's departure, that bystander was then assaulted and sent to the hospital with a concussion uh, and other significant injuries. This was happening right outside of the library um, a couple of nights ago. I think that when we get to the discussion of our um, commissions, work plan for the next few years, there's conversation about police resources and about public safety downtown and that the increasing violence that we're seeing occasionally downtown is something we need to take very seriously. And I'm glad for our conversation on Saturday um, just putting it on the forefront of our agenda. So thank you. I just want to thank the commissioners who came out for the retreat and who sent in their um, valuable suggestions. And it was, for those of you who watched the video, a fun retreat. And we've all been on retreats that weren't. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you for those who helped make it so. Staff included. That's good. Um, I just want to thank everybody, too, that uh, showed up on Saturday. I think we did have a, a good retreat. I think we have a really good work plan for the next two years. <laughs> Um, and also some good discussion on uh, the direction of the commission uh, over the next uh, period of time. So I appreciate everybody. Uh, I just want to say I really appreciated how the retreat went. I didn't expect it to be enjoyable in the least. <laughs> <laughs> I just did. And, uh, and I enjoyed the time there and thought it was productive. It's about as good as it can be. I'm sorry I wasn't there. Uh, I was off on military duty, but I you discussed my ideas and I, we were well received, so I appreciate that. Um, you know, uh, when it comes to homelessness, drugs, and protests, I mean, a common theme for the police is separating a few bad actors from otherwise law abiding folks who need assistance, frankly. I think engagement with people, um, the people involved, is critical. Uh, it's a challenge with our shortage of police officers, uh, something that becomes more apparent to me longer the longer I'm on this commission. I hope we can continue a focus on community policing and public engagement with the new chief. Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, congratulations on your uh, promotion. Uh, have not seen him for, yeah, however, yeah. And they're never temporary. <laughs> or temporary becomes a long time. Um, at least in education it did. Uh, Steve was very complimentary of the retreat when he reported to uh, to our group and uh, thought it was very productive. The, the good news from our meeting uh, this month is it didn't generate any new uh, topics for the police commission, um, <laughs> at, at least immediately. Uh, the chief uh, did our in-service training uh, or our service training, uh, talked about his perspective on discipline and, and the procedures that are used when there are accusations that are, are founded and uh, 
what he believes and and certainly we see from our experience what happens is the cases are adjudicated and then uh, action is taken uh, either to dismiss or to uh, not to dismiss the employee but to dismiss the uh, the allegation or to apply discipline and then we re reviewed five service complaints and and i think the feeling of the uh, review board was that they varied in range both in seriousness and in uh, the effective reporting uh, some of the supervisors provide everything you need to understand uh, their review of the case and some while probably dealing with the service issue directly with the employee don't always provide the same level of detail in their written report um, but it was helpful uh, we found in general those cases were uh, very well handled and then uh, the auditor reported uh, to city council on uh, monday night uh, his annual report i don't know if you all get a summary from leah or not of that anyway it, it will be available uh, I think the oh, it's, it's already up on the website. All right, <laughs> I haven't had time to link to it yet. Um, increase in the number of calls, number of complaints and intakes. Um, one of the uh, members of the review board noted, and I think it's significant, that the number of internally generated complaints. Uh, was significant uh, so the system is doing what I think people had hoped it would do uh, it's it's being used and it's it's raising issues that need to be raised and I'll defer to Bob thank you, thank you. I just wanted to take time to thank uh, Carter for <coughs> securing an invitation for the downtown uh, meeting next uh, Monday night and I plan to be there and I told her I hope uh, maybe also has an interest in things that, like what Edward just spoke about in the downtown area would, would like to see solutions to these problems and perhaps they would uh, like to attend. So it's a, it sounds like an interesting concept working together in a multidiscipline level to attack some of the problems we have today. So thank you, Carl. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so if we could take a minute and look and review and approve the minutes from last meeting. Um, I do have one suggestion. I was not here at the meeting, uh, but, um, but Jessica asked me if we could change the minutes around her comments for public comments and um, add so uh, where it says clarify that the EPD, if we can add EPD employees, can and to change support to participate in community organizations. So it's on groups up here. So okay with that. Any other changes or things to note to the minutes? Well, you've noted that you weren't here. I wasn't here either, and it's not on there. <laughs> it's okay with me. <laughs> Will the um, minutes be accepted as amended? Second. Second. Thank you. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Perfect. So we will move on to the chief report from Captain Mason. Well, I am not the chief, so I don't have all the details of the report, but uh, I hope you get us through that. Yeah. Turn it on. That's the first gesture. Yeah, it's a complicated system that you sold it for. Okay, so the first uh, amendment here is that it's made. 
scared me when I'm like, well, yeah, they're cool. <laughs> so, so the chief was pretty busy, as he always is. His calendar is packed. Um, but he did a lot of different things. Uh, he met with, he frequently meets with department work groups and teams. Steps out often to uh, meet with different investigative units and the divisions within the department. He attended the recent Citizens Review Board meeting to provide training, and I know that he also attended a previous meeting just to uh, observe. He was a guest speaker at the Public Safety Panel for the Eugene Springfield Leadership Program. Did anybody attend that one? He does some ride-alongs, and he did one with uh, both the police and the communication center. And he was a guest speaker for the Rubicon Society. And I know he spent about two days doing police officer final interviews. We had, we had uh, five, or I'm sorry, 11 candidates that he interviewed over the course of, I think, two days. Okay. And uh, he does meet with all of them before they get passed on. How many days? We have a total of 12, including his. <laughs> um, I think we'll talk a little. Uh, so I know we have uh, just a little feedback more on the officer finals. We have 11 or 10 moving forward into the psychological and official testing. And we've also, I think we have extended offer letters to two laterals. So we're hoping to get uh, those folks on board in June. He attended the all-city meeting, there were two of those, like Tex attended, and uh, we hosted the National Volunteer Week celebration here last Friday for all of our volunteers and providing some awards to our well-deserved volunteers. Okay. Uh, in the news, I was just telling Scott, I don't read the newspaper, it's sad sometimes. So, uh, we did, uh, I think these are kind of a little bit older. They're not the most recent news, but uh, we had a suspect arrested on several charges following burglary and thefts. Uh, interesting little paper where a fellow was impersonating an OLCC inspector. We were able to identify him and get him arrested. We did send out some information uh, from the Linda's office on the parking fine scam. It was much like, um, the other ones, this this one was saying they were municipal court and had a parking fine. It was kind of a new new one for us where they're actually saying EPD and the municipal court. So we sent some information out about that. And we put a word out about the occupied burglaries through unlocked doors in hopes of getting people to actually lock their doors. Uh, Wells Fargo bank robbery. I think that suspect is still outstanding. Pharmacist was arrested for tampering with drug records at the Weimar, I believe. And we had an attempted kidnapping on Echo Hollow Road, which is trouble sized heavily as well. Uh, looking forward, we have the employee award ceremony coming up on May 24th. And so I know the POI, PIO office and many of the other staff are uh, gearing up for that. It's going to be a week the Valley River Inn. The police captain candidate process is in full swing. It's been posted for about two weeks now. It closes on the 26th, and I would know that because I'm going to put it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the chief police candidate process is also in the works right now. It's at the HR level where, um, according to the chief yesterday, he said that they're going to be looking for a, uh, a firm to lead a hunt to help identify top candidates and they expect to have them hired and in, in the works within the next month or two. So it won't post for still several months, but they're actively searching for the firms of Okay, that's hiring. Policy updates uh, that he's reviewed and have, has been pushed out to the department already are procedure 3.17, which is video monitoring and recording. That was, uh, Kind of a big change to that one. And I'm believing we can just review some of them they did, but they're all available on the website. Right. Uh, procedure 12.2 specialized investigative equipment. Uh, just talked about who was responsible and how to check it out. And policy 815 was unintentional discharges. Any questions? Because I would send them to Kyle. Um, the DLP report. 
if you did tell me that this was the same one that you guys saw last month, because we haven't got a monthly DLP report, but I'm happy to go through it with you and answer any questions. Um, we had the call for service density map. I thought this was a pretty good map. Uh, the green is the public initiated activities, and those are obviously folks calling in for help in their neighborhoods. And then we have the officer initiated, which is them observing and, and taking enforcement action. And you can see that it's pretty spot on. So we've, we've got the cops in the right places. This little green dot kind of center right here, the little sort of yeah, that's the one. The fact that it doesn't show up over on the officer initiated yeah. without even looking more closely, I'm guessing this is shoplifting at the uh, uh, 29th and Atlanta. Oh, market choice. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this little tiny map I can see is so small. Yeah, it's definitely not going to be 18. Yeah, you're probably mm -hmm. Yeah, because you're not going to find that patrol. So the yeah, officers look right, initiated. So right. Probably a couple more like that or if they're shopping centers. Yeah, mostly. <coughs> so uh, three year calls for service trend is we're pretty much there. But the interesting thing about this chart is when you look at the public initiated calls have increased, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say significantly, but there's a trend that they're increasing and our officer initiated is decreasing. Yeah. To what do you attribute that? Great outreach. <laughs> uh, that would be a good question. I, you know, I think just more people, well, I think when you get into some of these other maps, you're going to see where the more, majority of the calls are coming from. And I think that's Whitaker, West U, downtown. More people are calling from those areas. and. The adverse response to that is that officers don't have as much time to do self-initiated activity when they're responding to the calls for service. Yeah, I wasn't as concerned with the increase, which is pretty much trending across the country in, in public calls. I was more concerned with the decrease in officer issues. Well, I, I think that's because we can show that we've had a 30% increase in the public initiated, which we dispatch the officers. So we're not, we're not. Uh, we haven't taken a lot of calls off the plate that we're not going to respond to. So if you got a dog running around barking, we're going to send an officer to that, which is then going to preclude them from driving around the neighborhood and finding their own activity. Okay. Does that, does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, calls for service response at all times. And if I remember correctly from the presentation, this chart, is um, the, from the time of the call coming into the dispatch center to the time that the officer arrives on scene, as well as how long a call is held. So it's not the time that it takes the officer to get to, get to a call. We've asked for that hopefully in the next month's report. Um, they're, holding, they're holding pretty steady on that across the line. There's a couple of anomalies. We were looking specifically at this one in 2015, trying to figure out what happened in February but we haven't got a report back on that one yet. Um, Wasn't there a really big snowstorm in February of 2015? It, it could have been. And a lot of times you can, you can look There was at, a very big snowstorm. You can look at <laughs> either storms or uh, we get spikes when college comes back to town and when they go away, it drops. So I mean, you can kind of see trends. So that, that very well could be a storm. Respond, so priority one and two calls are life-threatening, uh, assault, burglary, robbery kinds of things, in progress calls, whereas the three, fours, and fives are uh, perhaps a named suspect but not a life-threatening type situation. And obviously our call times are increasing on those, which is not necessarily a good thing. We obviously only have a bucket with so many cops in it that can respond, and with that, it sometimes Cops are tied up on calls, so they're not able to respond as quickly to the number of priority ones and twos. So we've asked our crime analysis unit to drill down into these a little more, like I said, and also see exactly what our response time for the officers is once they get dispatched, how long it's taken for us to get to these calls. Calls for service by neighborhood. 
our three biggest ones, which also are some of our smallest in population, are West University, Whitaker, and actually downtown. Right here, 29, 25, and 23,000 calls for service, and this is a three-year period also. Um, but interestingly, their calls for service per 1,000 population has went down in those areas, and I would attribute that to the fact that we have dedicated patrols in those areas, and that they've been the frequent um, recipients of our hotspot details by patrol, where we're directing our officers to focus their energies in those areas. And as far as the drops in these particular neighborhoods, I don't have an easy answer, but it's good news for them. So those are actually increases, I'm sorry. These are decreases in the blue. So take that back. I read the chart wrong. Yeah, so these guys have increased and that's why they are our hotspots. So we're, we, that's why we are directing in hopes to bring them down. downtown operational area you can pick a hot spot and if you can name it I'll give you a brown <laughs> this map I tried to look at we looked at it before and we could pick out library Keezy Square you know the the noticeable locations um, the calls for service in these areas over the last three years has increased 22 percent and obviously it's been all over the media it's, it's in all of the topics of conversation throughout the city the problems that we're experiencing downtown this year as well with uh, our dedicated 10 officers already to downtown. We uh, sent two more for the summer months and they're already deployed in an effort to try to attack this problem to help remedy it as well as all the measures by the city council. And um, I don't have the presentation perhaps next month, but she will bring it, but um, we partnered with the Parks and Open Spaces to develop some initiatives that aren't necessarily police officer driven or arrest citation driven but to try to regenerate some activities in these areas of town that bring a positive response instead of the negative. So look for those. I was actually really excited I might actually come downtown for now. Then we're going to put chess full size chess pieces in the park box. So if you're chess um, passing a lot of models from Market Street in San Francisco. They're practicing with for over a decade, including the Veteran Orchestra Association. And a lot of that has to do with just filling those spaces right. with people doing things that are not illegal. Right, well, that's what they're trying to do. Uh, West University, same thing. We've got our little hot spots. This right here is the hospital, and that is going to be the behavioral health unit. So they generate some activities for us. Um, that one is Highlands and Safeway, which it's a lot of shoplifting theft calls. And then I'm believing this is kind of the white bird area. Because I couldn't imagine that Selco's going to be so much activity. It's pretty quiet. Uh, again, they're getting a 22% increase in activity. Same thing, service providers and food providers. And this one's really ugly, but this is really a parts problem. The Whitaker activity now. Um, they've increased 49% over the years, the last three years. So I mean, I think frankly, they've had the biggest spike in activity. <clears throat> and a lot of that has to do with the number of parks that are actually located within that area. So obviously the parks is addressing their issues with us. And part of that project was uh, the parks ambassadors. They've hired four this year and they have also park post that they're putting at uh, the park blocks. So again, that we're trying some different activities to try to change the behavior in the parks. And we've also got two dedicated bike officers this summer who are going to be working not just the Whitaker parks, but the parks where there's a flux of activity because they frequently get tired of being targeted in one park and they'll go find another one that they think they're invisible. So, yeah, until the neighborhood calls. Um, select park activity, again, it hasn't risen significantly. Get the little trends through the summer months, obviously, but the you know, brush grows up and you can find places. 
and then both side by category. This one is kind of an interesting chart. Um, our personal crimes has relatively stayed the same, which is good in the fact that it hasn't risen bad and that it hasn't decreased significantly. Property crimes is up slightly, 6.1%. And our society crimes, which is our basic quality of life issues, trespass, disorderlies, drinking in public, that sort of stuff has actually decreased significantly, which I find interesting. So I think we're asking to see anything we've done recently that's helped address that. Um, so that that decrease helped us significantly in the total change. Let's officers and resources go more to prisons and right, more crimes, right? And then this one just back to me up. Loud noise party calls for service. I looked at this one and I said it's stayed pretty much the same over the last three years, regardless of what we do in regards to social host ordinance or party patrol. I hear every year it's our right to party. That's why we came here. So the kids aren't going to stop. And um, so I don't know how they're going to, how patrol's going to be working to address this. But it's a uh, pretty consistent thing. Anybody have any questions? I have one. Um, did, did they hire the captain on the process that they went through? They didn't. Okay. Um, anything else? Yeah. Thanks for uh, having me. And I'm going to um, depart a little bit early myself. I appreciate you moving me up on the calendar. I forgot that I had another engagement this evening. So. So I appreciate you coming. Thank you. I, I too must go, actually. So we're not going to the same again. Are you sure? I just assume. Well, are you? <laughs> nope, I'm not going there. Okay. So, we're going to move into our uh, continued review of the Code of Conduct policies. So, Mr. Williams, thank you for joining us. It's a quad. Oh, okay. <laughs> You have six. You have six, two, four, five, six, seven, eight. No, or it doesn't count. I don't think you can count. Seven, seven. seven. okay. Seven. Sorry. Seven. Count to me. Seven. Seven. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure we don't take action. Yeah. Right. Accidentally. <laughs> Thank you. You always take action. We might have to redo it. <laughs> So what I handed out, uh, there's nothing new in that. Um, I didn't double check how the format was sent out last time and made additional comments thinking that the comments would be printed or would send, be sent to you. Unfortunately, we realized that the comments uh, didn't make it into the packet because Carter followed the format she used last time and I didn't make the request. So what I've handed out don't have any additional changes. It just has a little extra information about the changes that were made. And then there were sections where I added comments um, that would hopefully kind of explain why or where we were at with things. Just one or two that say that it was left so the senior staff can discuss it, um, or acknowledging that there was somebody that wanted something changed, but that at this point uh, that it wasn't going to be changed, uh, or was going to be a senior staff. I mean, all of this is going to be a discussion for senior staff, uh, and then uh, and then another round of the union probably once that's done. So. <laughs> this long evolving process that we're starting to see some light at the end of the tunnel now. So we're kind of at an unusual point here where we've got um, we've had a lot of changes um, and for the most part what's in the I don't think so. I don't confuse it. I've got enough stuff I'm trying to juggle here, but thank you for the offer. I appreciate it. <laughs> so I'm going to go through my notes from last time 
and then also referencing the new version and just kind of talk us through the comments and suggestions that were made last time. Um, and, uh, and then we'll go from there. So the first line that we came to was uh, the truthfulness. Um, anybody have any thoughts or suggestions leading up to truthfulness, which is the 1001.4.4 in the old version, basically the professional standard section. Again, it's going to be a little bit wonky in a place or two. This is one of those because we changed up the formatting a little bit. Um, so through the purpose and scope, the code of ethics at the top, philosophy and values, discipline policy, professional standards. So in that section is where the truthfulness was, and there was some discussion around that. So leading up to that point, uh, any new thoughts or concerns or whatnot? All right. So um, the comment here was that uh, just ensuring that people know they have an affirmative duty to correct an accidental lie when they realize they've made a mistake as part of the truthfulness. I didn't specifically address that mostly because, again, I stole the truthfulness section straight from Portland Police Bureau and modified it as needed to, to fit uh, what we're doing. Borrow. Uh, sorry. <laughs> no, I stole it, but I'm sure they'll be fine with it. We, we trade things pretty regularly, policies and whatnot. Just give me your note. All right. So then we get to the new, the new truthfulness statement. Any uh, thoughts, concerns about that? Yeah, the, the top of that, the, the, the 1001.5, just the, the title of this section. Okay. And I don't know what it could be, but I guess it just, to me, it just says conduct that may result in discipline. It's almost like I'd rather say this is unacceptable conduct, or because whether you're disciplined or not, I mean, this is just unacceptable not to be truthful, not to be courteous, I guess. And I don't know, and I also think about we talked about doing this more affirmatively. I got, I guess I can speak for that. So does that, yeah, but does that make sense? I mean, I don't know what it, it just seems like, instead of just making it to be, well, we're, you're going to get in trouble. It should be that this, this, these are just unacceptable, or these are not. Yeah, I think that's say that something in the vein of expectations of conduct. I think you give my one of Oh, yeah, no, I, yeah, you were, yeah, okay. absolutely, Perfect. yeah. And whatever you, yeah, no, it did, because I mean, I was just looking for a better way to, to say that, because I just. So, the, um, trying to change the way the entire thing reads is going to be an interesting project, and I have a, I have a volunteer uh, who was, uh, worked on policy here, worked for the city for a long time. Uh, and she comes in and does a few days a week usually. She's off in Texas at her vacation home for an extended period. But I sent this to her about two and a half weeks ago and said, hey, I got Project Impossible for you while you're on vacation. <laughs> um, and she is working on it. The problem is, is that there are some areas that just sort of that have to be written in the negative, that there's no way to put a positive spin. And so it'll be interesting to see what she's able to come up with because we, we want it to still flow appropriately and not necessarily flip back and forth. We also haven't addressed the, um, uh, the, the the issue of you or officer or employee, how we refer to people. So there is going to be that formatting is still there, and we haven't dealt with that. Uh, she's supposed to be coming back, actually, uh, I think middle of this month, late this month, hypothetically, as long as everything goes as planned. Um, and so I'll lean on her to help kind of make that transition. Um, She's just very good at it. It's it's a good use of um, her volunteer time, as opposed to me, who's not very good at that. Can we do another step? Or, I I agree with the chair about the title, and I'm wondering if the title isn't really in the opening line of the paragraph below. What if instead of conduct we use causes for disciplinary action? Or something like that. 
Makes no difference to me, so I'll take a good look at it. Yeah, so I'll take a look at some of the suggestions and, and wordsmith it and, okay. and see. So, yeah. <clears throat> All right, so we're back to the truthfulness block. And I hadn't had anybody say anything, so I'm going to slowly, or I'm going to start at least moving forward in my notes and yeah. see where we're going. All right. And yeah, at any time, if you realize that there's something you want me to go back to, it's no problem at all. <clears throat> all right, so the next section is 1001.5.1, and that's abuse of position or authority. Um, and there was a comment about removing the subjectivity, uh, personal gain is, uh, I believe that, that that was too subjective. Um, I've got too many copies of my own to keep myself mm -hmm. on track. But. I'm with you. I have like three of written. I know. I have well, some notes from Steve. It's that's that's the problem with these. Once we get to this point, I'm trying to keep track of what changes came from where, so that yeah, so it's uh, it's a little tricky. Um, and so that section, uh, the personal gain we added for self or others. That was a comment that was made that what well, was a personal gain just for you? But what if you're doing something for your family member, or for a friend, or whatnot? Uh, it's reasonable, and so I added that. Uh, the subjectivity of personal or financial gain, the problem that we see throughout, and those are that's one of um, uh, Steve's concerns with a number of different areas of the subjectivity, but the problem is, is that like we also found a discussion last time, um, to try to define it, that can arise in so many different arenas. Uh, the conflict of interest is another one where we pull out of what is a conflict of interest, and I actually have some uh, link the ORS with the definition, but even that, there's so many other ways that we can wind up with a conflict of interest because we as police dabble in everything. Um, it's not like we're bankers and so you have a financial conflict of interest, it's very obvious. It's The conflict of interest can be a thousand different types and so there's a certain amount that it just has to be big and we have to be able to just evaluate it as it comes along. Uh, so that'll that'll be a theme as we go through here, where there's just a number of areas where Steve make, has made the suggestion, and, and I'm leaving it as is, and and the and that concern will be brought forward to command uh, as we work through it with them next, and uh, and then it'll be up to them to decide how how they want to how they want to make that read, how the chief wants to, what he feels comfortable with. Um, okay. So that was the uh, that was the only comments that I had on that section. I think Edward has one on that section. I do. Okay. Uh, it's uh, number B there. That'd be. There is no way that I could read this sentence that doesn't make the skin on the, <laughs> the hairs on the back of my neck stand up a little bit. To obtain special privileges, come up without approval from the chief. That either needs to be more clarified or something, because I'm just trying to imagine some average citizen seeing just that sentence and going, what, wait, the chief can give you special privileges just because you're a cop? So how do we say what you were trying to say here without that trigger for some people, that special privileges phrase? So that concern was brought up, in, and it actually is, is uh, If we if we have an employee who has who requests an investigation into something that we would not normally dispatch an officer to, mm -hmm. and we grant that investigation, that is a special uh, that's a special privilege. Um, that may be very probably very unhappy. <laughs> that may be very appropriate because it's for accountability and transparency to the public. Um, and honestly, the situation that came up was where the chief requested OSP to do a to conduct an investigation. Um, by this policy, if we didn't have that line, mm -hmm. um, he would be he would be outside of policy because if you call OSP to ask for that, sure. they'd tell you no. But there's a public interest in having it done. It's reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, I think we'd be disappointed if it was turned down. And, and that was a specific scenario. 
So that's why it's at the at the highest level, and and the chief has to sign off on on whatever yes. privilege that may be. So that's the example. How you try to encompass the the myriad of random ways that that might come out, yeah. I don't know. But how do we not give some sort of a caveat because there are some circumstances where it is appropriate and there has to be some level of trust that the chief is going to make the right decision i think the policy makes perfect sense i yeah. think the way this is worded is asking for some modicum of trouble small or large from someone who simply okay. sees that phrase um, honestly you know i've heard people members of the public praise the chief for taking the step that he did in that instance i feel he didn't do the right thing for instance. but reading this sentence wouldn't lead me to think that this policy had been what had been applied there. So how do we make that more clear? That's all I'm saying. How about if you could just sort of change that around and say the chief must approve all special privileges? And some definition of what we're talking about with special privileges. It's, again, just looking at it from the point of view of some member of the public looking at a snippet of this document. What are you talking about here? Extra donuts or what are the special privileges? The special privileges have to do with, say, the safety of the officer's family. That would be something that would be worthwhile putting in here as a friend. Do you have a suggestion on how to encapsulate that? I don't. Okay. Sorry. Just going to make trouble for you. <laughs> I might. Yeah. Just, just sort of if, if, that. If, if you yeah, move, no, I appreciate it, but I'm also going to ask for suggestions if you raise that. Sorry. If, if you move B down to the bottom of that list, okay and start the phrase with exceptions may be granted by the chief of police or by the chief that's good yeah it's the term privileges be, that, that just doesn't work well and that, that does sound and like it's a special privilege yeah. well and what is that that i think that it's the terminology is all you know, the that one thing about sense. doing that, though, is that the C is avoid the consequences of illegal acts, and the chief cannot. <laughs> <laughs> so you may have to mess with it a little bit, because the chief, of course, can't absolve somebody who's committed something illegal. I, would, I might go out on a limb and say, though, that there's a certain might amount happen. of that that might happen. Or, the, or that we know that that's illegal and that and that that line may not apply 100 percent to every portion of that yeah particularly if somebody were working in special assignment yeah something came up that that's wasn't cleared ahead of time well and that's why this is hard because we yeah. work in so much gray area and, and so many different facets that, um, but yeah i would move that to the end yeah exceptions yeah Or may only be. Or, or it may be to obtain special privileges and then, then at the end without with, with removing the whole chief part there just adding e exceptions may be approved by the chief of police or uh city manager if the chief of police like is the one making a request or something like that so we can we can certainly yeah. play with that a little bit and i agree it's one of those where we had a line and then we tacked on to try to yeah. so we'll uh we'll take a good look at that again that, as you know, you know, I have this small Facebook publishing empire. It deals with public safety issues in, in some of its facets. And when I reprinted uh, the article about, uh, what was it, Alec Gardner? Uh, not a breathalyzer test, a field sobriety test. And what I immediately see on the page that I manage is public saying, well, if I'd been pulled over, this guy got special treatment. There's no understanding within the public about why it would be appropriate to deal with this one way or another because it was a police officer from a different jurisdiction pulling over to the some surround. They have no concept of those things. So when they see something like special privilege, that's all they think about. Yeah. It's, oh, okay, but if I were a cop, I would have gotten it. So yeah. in any way that we can get away from that phraseology or getting an impression, I think it's better for the department. I think it's going to not turn off taxpayers down the road yeah. I mean, some small road. well and something interesting about that most people don't realize that we don't use portable breathalyzers here either you have to have probable cause to arrest mm -hmm. to take somebody to the machine and and a lot of public i had a few people that were that commented to me about that mm -hmm. situation and, and i said well, we don't do portable breathalyzers and, and they were shocked really 
because people feel like that's something that we would do, um, and, and we don't. So that's that's another interesting part of this about the education of the public about the circumstances. And, and, and PC is a high bar. I mean, you got to have, regardless of what they blow, you have to have enough to take them to jail. So. Well, there are people who are real surprised that when they call 911, there are not a bunch of cops sitting around in a room like this waiting to be dispatched for their problem. Yeah, we're not the fire department. What do you look at? <laughs> Even they might be on another call. They just say, yeah. Anyway, moving around. Yeah, we digress. <laughs> yes, uh, So then, where did this go? Okay. So then uh, in the copy in your packet, or actually in both copies, because yeah, yours are pretty much the same, uh, we added line up wrongfully or unlawfully uh, exercise your authority. Uh, and that was taken from the conduct section and moved into here. And that was a suggestion that just uh, somebody felt like it should make more sense. Which I have a note probably who that was later on. But that's where that popped in from. Um, 10.0153A, accepting or soliciting any bribe. It was suggested that that's illegal and it doesn't really need to be covered in here anyway. Um, I really chewed on it. There's there's a lot of in here that could, could be illegal for police to, to do. Uh, and I left it in just for, again, that'll be left in for senior staff discussion. Um, because it still seems like even if it is illegal, we still want to have a policy violation against you for doing it made sense so we'll take a look at that but that's why that was that was left there um, second here. Okay. Okay, and I am actually in the back of this just a little bit. I'm not sure how I managed to do it, but I switched packets notes mm -hmm. part way through. So I had some notes on this one and then the rest of them were in the in the main packet here. Uh, so there was a question raised under C of Skip okay. Okay, so then uh, I don't have second. Okay. I'm, I'm still confused somehow. And, and Steve had a question on, on this section. He did. So, you see that? I think he said it's all that. Just about the negligence violation on the D on 55.4. Yeah, that's in the margin of uh, Okay, so what section was that? Uh, the adherence to laws and department policy under D. And you have a comment that addresses it. It looks like you want to take that to command staff. Yeah. Just, he just says he's still worried about it. So. 
Yeah. Well, and, and I don't think he, when he wrote those notes, that was not with him with having the comments. And so, yeah, that's what he said. Was he okay. Those. Change knowing to willful that makes negligent more clear. Uh, if we change knowing to what? To willful. To willful. Knew what the rule was and didn't do it. Didn't know what the rule was and didn't do it. And then uh, in the 10153, uh, were there any other concerns about that section? I think the only thing we have is just that uh, letter A initially. Yeah, Steve's comments about the knowing or negligent hard to enforce seems problematic. Um, and then there was a little bit of a rewrite there under section B. Um, and so what I did was I broke that out into, into two different components. Um, Failing to properly and fully report activities that have resulted. Th okay, so this is why I'm confused. Failing to properly and fully report activities that have resulted in official contacts, such as being cited or arrested with this or any other law enforcement agency. And then that same line went on to say, even if you're off duty, essentially. So I added a second section. Uh, failing to properly and fully report any time where you were acting in the capacity of a police officer outside of work. And so really just trying to make it clear what those were. There was some question about what that would have meant. Um, and so. That was the uh, that was the the change there. Okay. So then we'll move on to associations with felons uh, and indicted persons, uh, and that's one where Portland Police Bureau again has a has a very clean way of, uh, of putting that. That's um, just easy to follow, easy to understand. Addresses the concerns that the union had, uh, and I believe addressed some of the concerns that were were made here. A uh, known convicted felon, um, somebody commented that this really should be addressed for um, the person that's a known criminal and so that the, the image of the department and that person's credibility aren't tarnished, not necessarily to, to keep us away from bad people. Um, it is certainly, I'm speaking kind of broadly here, but um, were we also it's not a bad thing to have somebody that got in trouble six or seven years ago to have a police officer as a potentially positive influence in their life also. And so there is some benefit to not just saying you can't talk to these people. Um, and then the family component of making it clear that uh, that you can still go to Christmas even if your long lost cousin Eddie is a drug addict is gonna be there. That doesn't mean you can't go to Christmas dinner. So uh, they do a good job with that. Uh, did anybody have any thoughts or concerns about Portland's policy? And it was again pretty much a copy paste, address the bureau uh, references. Attendance. So there was a question in C where the previous version it had been crossed out, uh, failing to report for work shift or to replace an assignment at the time specified in the appropriate uniform and fully equipped perform duties without reasonable excuse. And the without reasonable excuse had been crossed out. I don't know why. I read it several times. Uh, I can't figure out why they wouldn't have an accommodation for being able to call in and make a reasonable excuse or talking to your boss. 
Um, so I went ahead and added that back in. Um, I did note that uh, that reasonable excuse should be given like yesterday. So uh, without reasonable excuse and or without notifying the watch commander at the earliest possible time. So there needs to be some sense of urgency. You can't show up and then, and then fail to do your job properly or not be ready and then tell us four days later when somebody calls you on the carpet for it. You need to be up front uh, and, uh, and we need to know about that. That was the only that was the only thing I had about that section. Uh, bribes, gratuity, and payment. We suggested to cross out bribes, uh, accepting or soliciting any bribe. Uh, that's a crime and covered elsewhere. That was another one of those um, where that concern was brought up. This is the problem. I just rem I just realized it. We moved some sections around. Yes. Send me new copy. I, was, I couldn't okay. figure out why I was yeah. out of order. See, and these changes were actually some of these I had done before the last meeting even, and so we're talking like a month ago now. Okay. Yeah, that's why I was so confused that's that they were the they were somehow out of order. Um, so we're on courtesy. Well, we can actually step back to the bribes, gratuity, and payment, and then I can maybe speak to it to an item or two, um, just to make sure that we've covered it all. Yeah, I think that's that's just where the, the crime component was brought up. I left that at is so so that it can be an ongoing discussion. I guess that is probably the only um, my note here is that I left it in for further review. Um, so then we're on to courtesy. Oh, glad we let's have it up. I thought I was going crazy there for a second. <laughs> okay, so the courtesy section. Uh, this again is one where uh, where we, I took it from Portland, because again, that's another section that's, just, that's very well done by Portland. Uh, and then I tacked on our, in fact, you can even see that the lettering is off there, so that needs to be a D. Um, and I'll, Steve's comments were that it feels like it's tacked on because it is. It doesn't really follow the tone of, of everything else. But I wanted to get the um, at least get that concept in there, uh, and that's one. Well, a lot of this will probably need to be modified to fit the new, whether we try to make it in the more affirmative or not. So we'll smooth that out so that it matches. Um, did he have some issue concerns about that line in general? Or was it just no, that it seemed um, like it was it, short? It needed uh, it just needs to the match. sequence. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he's just more of talking about it. Just the first three okay. sections are complete sentences. And that one's kind of a okay. I was I was thinking for some reason I don't have any notes here, so he must not have. I was thinking that somebody maybe it was just the the, the union and I kind of went around the table on that one. So maybe that's what I'm thinking of that there was some concern about that line. I only have one little small concern on this section. Okay. Um, and it's in A. All right. And if we talk about being respectful, courteous, and considerate, but we start out with supervisors, subordinates, and all other members and the public. Shouldn't we be the public first? Then maybe we could throw in our employees and supervisors. I think that we'd rather have them to know that the top priority in ours is that they're courteous to the public. It just seems like we're like, hey, by the way, be the public too. Uh, Scott and then Bob. Yeah, I noticed that as well. I think the public should be first. Okay. And then second, can you give me an example when um, you're using profanity to establish control. So yeah, I, I can. <laughs> I don't want to. Do that. <laughs> That's not what I do. But, but I, I, right I, I, just I just watched. Oh it. yeah, I won't actually act yeah, out. Yeah. Yeah. I would describe the situation. Yeah, but I just watched it, and the reason I said that is I just watched a video from a, a dash cam where profanity profanity was being used by the police officer. It wasn't necessary. Yeah. It's, it's not professional. So I'm trying to understand why that would be in there and what circumstances <clears throat> that it would it could be used effectively. Yeah. Um, 
Did your thought have anything to do with that, or should I answer That's that? That's exactly what I have a hand up for you yeah, with that section. And, and uh, what I wanted to point out was the, that this came up before in in a policy, obviously in the code of conduct policy is what we were talking about at the time. And I remember specifically convincing the commission at that time to a majority vote to support that because of certain situations that police face where they're dealing with people who are not, you know, um, I would say at the, at the level of criminality where a person does not respond to polite talk and in the process of trying to gain control of a violent situation, they may have to use forceful. And I believe at that time, the, the wording had something to do with harsh language, not police will not use harsh or uh, language. And I've forgotten the other word they used, but it was uh, rough language, I think they said, using rough language. And, and the, the commission seemed to agree that and there are going to be times when you're going to have to use force and at the same time maybe be forceful in your voice. And to the extent that in order to show that you, know, you are being serious, a police officer may lose uh, a drop of word here or there that maybe you wouldn't use in polite conversation. But that's just a part of having to do the job and gain control of, of a bad situation that's violent. Now, I don't know about the dash cam video. I don't know if someone was just being smart and, you know, talking to a person, whether it was a violent fight that they were having or trying to gain control of a person who was violent. And, and I think there should be exceptions. And I think earlier in the policy, it mentions that they will be judged on a, a limited basis or uh, on a basis of the cer all of the totality of the circumstances. And I think that should be allowed. And that was approved by the commission, went to the chief, and he took it out of there. And I remember specifically sitting there and saying, I'm never going to have anything in a policy about not using about using rough language being OK. A police officer not allowed to use rough language. And I thought, oh, well, that's the end of that. But now here it is again. So well, I, I don't know whether he's going to. No, okay. I, yeah, you so may I, not get I, any further than that. that. But my point in saying it was that, that I thought it was valid, and and to answer your question, I I think there are times where well, it's absolutely necessary. And I think we kind of went a little out of order because I think Scott's question never got answered, and you were trying to answer. Well, he asked Scott's me if question. that was my concern too, so then I went ahead. Yeah. So both of Yeah, I was wondering. Yeah, because I just figured I could. Yeah. So I, my apologies for getting us out of order. Um, so what I like about this policy is that. Um, Profanity is overused, and in a lot of times where you see it on videos, it shouldn't be used when it's being used there. I like that we have a very, we have a, a, a feeling of not using profanity here at EPD. Um, and currently, it is against policy, and the chief will will sustain it every time. At least that's what he's come out and said for the most part. Uh, what I like here is that this allows for it to be a tactical decision and that the use of it has to be documented in your report and the reason for doing it. That um, you can't just throw it out there and then if you get called on the carpet, then try to justify why you let something slip out that shouldn't have slipped out. Um, I'll, tell, I'll tell you that um, there are times, there are people who don't react to, to please and thank you. Um, there are times when, if we're talking normally, even if I raise my voice and I start telling you sternly that you don't necessarily realize I'm serious. But if I tell you to get on the bleeping ground, because otherwise I'm about to tase you or pepper spray you or tackle you myself or potentially shoot you, it does evoke a response from some people at some times. And there are some times that it is, um, that it gets people's attention. And they, and I have seen it, I've used it tactfully on a few occasions. I'm not a cusser. I'm not a fighter. It's not my normal. It's not my normal way of communicating generally. Um, but I tell you, there's there are a time here and there where it gets people's attention and they know that you're serious. And to take that tool out of the toolbox seems uh, I have a hard time with it. Um, should it be used very sparingly? Should it be a decision and not an emotional response? Absolutely. Should it be documented in a report with an explanation of I tried to be nice. I said this, I said this, I said this. They were failing to comply. The situation was escalating. Um, I think that escalates the situation, though, as well it, for both but, sides. But at times it doesn't. I'll, I'll tell you, it doesn't. People listen. 
Um, I had I had one I had one person tell body me. cams and everything else, and it's been, I think it's going to take away from the officers' conduct and what they looked like to third parties viewing video. Yeah, I don't think it looks good, which is why I'm glad that it. I'm and glad that this that, policy is written this way. I, I would make sure that the police reports are reflective of that policy, then that if profanity is used, that they're actually being reported in the police reports. Yeah, well, if it's if it's as well. if it's discovered in an IA and it hasn't been explained, then they've got another policy violation. Sure, I think it kind of opens the door here, the window. It's come back. Yeah, so all other use of profanity will be judged on the totality of the circumstances in which it is used. An example may be if an employee's profanity, all such uses will be documented in a police report. So like anything, I mean, if you don't follow the, the policy, you could be subject to discipline or, a, or a, a, an allegation of misconduct. And that certainly is, is the possibility here. Are we going to start reviewing video to make sure that people uh, know? But it's there. We've told people that to follow it. It's very likely that the chief will nix it. Um, it also, this comes from Portland, who's been under under investigation by the DOJ. Um, this policy hasn't been hasn't been run through by them. Uh, they're a progressive agency similar to us. Uh, I think it's written in a way that, that I'm hoping that we can allow some some room. It still should be very sparing. It needs to be calculated. Um, but I tell you, if it's the last thing you're saying before you pull the trigger, and it might get somebody's attention, it might help make them realize that you're serious, which it sounds silly, because if you're pointing a gun at them, why wouldn't you? But I tell you, there's a lot of people that don't care that the cops are pointing guns at them. The gun doesn't change your behavior. It would be shocking to you how often that happens. I had a guy at Graveyard out on West 11th. We were doing a Dewey. Uh, brother showed up. They were disorderly. Uh, the other officer was doing the inventory and we kind of gotten separated um probably two or three in the morning i walk around the building or kind of start looking around the side to see what they're up to because they disappeared back to their car uh and i contacted them probably for me to bill and edward down there um and for some reason had to have an interaction with them and he brings his hands out and then he sets them on his hips on his waist here and all i can see was a black nub sticking out Mm -hmm. And so I draw down. I'm pointing my gun at him, and I'm yelling at him, get your hands up, get your hands up, get your hands up. Um, I'm hollering for my partner, hey, I need some help over here. Doesn't hear me, because we're now we've gotten around to we're at a point where, where he's not readily coming to my assistance. Uh, and I cuss at him, get your fucking hands in the air, or I'm going to shoot you. And at that point, finally, the hands came up. He's like, hey, man. And he's nonchalant, made no difference that I was pointing my gun at him and yelling at him. Um, but I went to a much more stern level of talking. And I tell you, it worked. Probably saved his life and me a lot of heartache that night and ongoing. So that's where, this is one example of where, it, where it, whether he would have come to that with three more warnings and get your hands in the air, or whether or not he would have come to that after I shot him once or twice or three times. I don't know, but I tell you, it uh, it made the difference that night. Um, so I just have a hard time taking that tool away. Sorry for my cursing, by the way, but it's hard to tell that story without <laughs> really feeling or understanding what the, what the mood was like. I think you were going to comment on this section. Yeah. And another kind of instance where this comes up isn't necessarily bad people that you're yelling for vanity at to try to get them to do something you want them to do, like get their hands out of the pockets of the dark. So there's a bit of my career was running security for an event of about 80,000 people or so. So I got a line of 5,000 people at the front gate, and someone in the bushes, in the trees, somewhere down, starts shooting me. I've got about 10 off-duty cops, about 20 security guards, and we start trying to get those people into the drainage ditches on either side of the road, and they're not listening. And so we're shouting at these people, get down, get down, you're being shot at, someone's shooting at you. And they didn't listen until we started cursing at them and pushing them. That's a little disappointing, but it's a lot about human behavior, was they didn't think we were serious. They just weren't listening. 
as a tool to express the seriousness of the situation, I'm willing to listen to another suggestion. Honestly, I would love that it be something that doesn't make the officer look unpro unprofessional or like they lost their cool. I would love that. But maybe I just said in my ways, but I know what's worked with people in the past, if there's another tool, I think we should go that in. And, and yes, if the profanity doesn't work as well as that. Does that make sense? So Scott, I've, I've made a note here of, the, of your concern, and I'm sure this will be a point of discussion, and, and there's a good chance that the chief will mix it anyway. Um, we haven't had a policy that was written well enough, I think, to cover that narrow window of having an opening for it, which is why I put it in and left it in as it was um, without writing that out of it, because I think it's worthy of, of the chief's uh, consideration. And I'll express, I'll, I'll make sure that he's aware of your, of your concern about it. Uh, and I think we all agree that it doesn't look good and it, uh, and it should be at, at most a very limited basis and it should be tactical, not emotional. And the problem is what you see most often is, is an emotional response. Um, so we'll make, we'll make a comment of it and, and uh, review. Uh, I, I, well, well, hold on. I have, I have a queue. I'm in the queue now. So okay. Don't worry about it. Well, um, well I, I got to say that I, I personally don't think it, there's a place for it. I think more other words can be used. I think we, this is old time police work where you get out and use that kind of language in a stressful situation. I think that whenever those words come out, I mean, you're starting, in my opinion, there's no offense by any point you get to, but that, that we've now lost a little bit of what we're out there for. So it's just my, I would not like to see that we have, I'd like it to say that we don't use perfectly, we don't, plain and simple. Uh, and if, if the commission feels that same way strongly, and we could do a motion that we want to say that we don't want to perfectly, we could vote on it and see if that is our recommendation. But that's one suggestion that we can do. But I, I agree with that, that same thing. So then I have Maury, and then I have Will, and then I have Terry. Uh, yeah, the, the comment I was going to make, and, and I tend to agree with with Scott on this. Those are fighting words, and and generally provoke fights. Generally, because of the use of blue team for every use of force. I think what we're doing with the language in the first sentence, uh, no, in the second sentence, all other use of profanity will be judged. It will be reviewed by the supervisor and blue team, and it may result in an allegation of misconduct. Like, that's really pretty clear. Um, And then it'll be up to the supervisor and possibly the chief to decide if there's merit in the allegation and if the allegation is sustained, what level of discipline is appropriate. And so I like it because of that second sentence. Will and Terry. So can I just ask a clarifying? Yeah. So are you saying that you do like the way it's written or you would like it something I, inserted saying that every time it's used that it will be entered in the blue team and then no i, 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 I think it will be entered things. i think it will be entered in blue team because generally it'll be used in a use of force situation okay okay meaning that either the officer is going to self-report or the officer is not going to self-report and then the public's going to report and it's going to come out and it's going to come out it's it's going to yeah it's going to be revealed okay and so because of that, you were supportive of having a look I, I, I think I'd leave it there. And it does put an employee on notice that they're going to be reviewed for it. It, it doesn't make me completely happy either, Scott, but yeah. I hesitate to mention this because it's sheer hearsay since I can't remember the reference. But just this last week, I read an article uh, by some psychologists they had found experimentally that the use of profanity adds strength for lack of what they're working on uh, for the person who's here. Uh, it, was, it was a 
scientifically verified. Um, but I, maybe we can find it if we if anybody is going to look for it, but probably not. Um, I'm inclined to support it the way it's written by someone. But when I say that, I'm imagining that this would be a rare exception and that it would be scrutinized. Um, I too would like Eugene to be free of profanity as I, in my perception, he was all the right alongside them, the officers are remarkably self-controlled. Sherry? Well, as it turns out, I was going to say something similar to what Maury said. If we put in there that there's no profanity allowed, if the occasion arises, as you said, it's probably going to be in a situation where it will be reviewed and it will be only part of all the things that they're going to be reviewing about this situation. And it may not rise to that's the most important thing that you use this word. No, it will be, you know, so I think it's going to get looked at if it's used. And everyone should know that it's going to get looked at if it's used, yeah. which means if you say no profanity, you're going to be better off, I think, in the long run saying not at all, because then people will know okay, better to not use it at all. But if it happens, I should say something or, you know, immediately say why, you know, I just think it's better if you say no and then walk it back if you have to walk it back in a specific occurrence. i just take out the example. I think uh, the, the sentence as an example may be et cetera, et cetera. Uh -huh. I, I just, I think it's clearer without it, you know. Yeah. I think it's better just to judge on the totality of circumstances. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's interesting because I I thought the example I thought I kind of thought that'd be the opposite that you'd like that or that people the public would like that to understand that that basically the profanity can be used as a use of force to try to avoid another. So. Yeah, I, I'll, uh, I'll make the note, and, and again, I'll, I'm gonna, uh, I will leave this as is and then bring all sure. the notes and comments, and, or if the commission wants to make a vote on to support or not support, um, however this shakes out, I'll, I'll bring forward to, to the, the next discussion all of the thoughts and comments just, and suggestions. I mean, first of the reason I say is, is, I've seen far many times when, too many times when people tried to give good guidance, and so they defined examples, and only to have people come back later and say, we see you're encouraging it right here. In yeah. fact, you're not encouraging it at all, but you know yeah. the way it gets read and the way it, the way it was yeah. written are different. Whereas if you leave it more generally, then it, it it's incumbent on the individual to say, okay, based on my training, you know, how do I feel? And so then it's more of a training issue, which I think is yeah. where we're getting at. You know, that we'd okay. like it to be a last resort. I just want to take us back to AA and the was uh, moving members of the public and not. Uh, and get lost in the notes there from my comments that followed. But maybe the public being first. Oh, yeah, I got a note for that. Yeah. I guess that part could have moved pretty fast there. Yeah. <laughs> nope, I got that. It's circled with a comment. I'll even put a uh, an arrow pointer line. I'll put that forward. Anything else on courtesy? Similar thing. I, I think it's important if we're going to talk about what profanity may be used at all, that's in question, to distinguish between, and it's, it's referred to here in one of those lines, basically name calling because you got angry with the person you're in contact with, as opposed to emphasizing, creating emphasis, as in get the bleep down is different from get the bleep down, you bleep, 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 bleep. You don't need the bleep, bleep, bleep. <laughs> yeah. Or you're yeah. acting like a bleep, bleep, bleep. Yeah. yeah. And so on. Why do you so, call him a bad name? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I imply. <laughs> but I think you see the distinction. That's all I have to say. Yeah. yeah. Oh, a absolutely. <laughs> and, and, and I, and that's, yeah. Yeah. You've I, addressed it in different lines here, but there may be some way to kind of pull this together. If yeah. you end up with a piece of policy that says there's a time and place for profanity, yeah. it's not a name call. Yeah. 
That's true. Will, if you stumble back into that article, and I'm going to I'm going to do some looking too. I'd be fascinated to read that. Get it right here. I saw oh, it already, last week. Oh, you already have it. I actually, saw it go by in my health news last week. Oh. Yeah, would you mind sending that to? Well, as those of us who deal with constant daily pain know, swearing helps. Swearing <laughs> helps a whole lot more than, say, screaming, crying, or all the other things that we don't like to think about doing when you hurt that badly. But doctors have actually done a study that shows that cursing helps. But that's not cursing anyone else. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, the other article. Well, I just wanted to say that it's it was concerned that's addressed in the very next paragraph. Paragraph or line C? C. Well, D. D. Fair to be. Oh, yeah. Fair to be. That will control your tempers. Or the no employee shall use epithets or terms. Yeah. 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 And to denigrate, particularly gender. Yeah, period. Right. <clears throat> so that makes the distinction between yeah. profanity and just talking Name somebody call. down. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I just hope the article that Andrew was going to give me doesn't make everybody start cussing them more, even at this commission meeting. It's only one way to get it. Go ahead. I may have missed it, but it should be D, and it looks like it's A or something. A, yeah, T type. Yeah. It's just a fragment. It's just a step to fragment. Yeah. Sorry, we might have caught that. Okay. Anything else, Curtis? Uh, all right. Whew. That was tough. <laughs> Moving forward. Thought that was going to be easy, huh? <laughs> no, no, I know. I knew that was going to be a topic of discussion. Okay. I anticipated that one. Uh, so that brings us to conduct. So just for organizational H um, was removed. Uh, because it's basically encompassed in courtesy. Um, so then, let me take a look here. So the this the basically A is the one about horseplay. There's some concern that um, just because you do it but get away with it because nobody gets hurt shouldn't be allowed. You shouldn't be. They wanted it written away, and we were getting at. We had the same intent. It was just getting the words so that it, so that we all agreed with it. Basically, getting out out there so that people aren't engaging in horseplay that may result in rather than if it results, then you get in trouble. So I so I tried to work that around. Engaging in horseplay that creates a reasonable possibility of or results in physical injury, property damage, or significant disruption of operations. Um, so I don't I don't we covered that. Any thoughts or concerns? My only note there was rework. I didn't put any specifics other than yeah, go ahead. I I wasn't comfortable with the use of the word horseplay. Um, and I think that I would exchange it for a behavior or conduct that results in or may result in. Okay. Let's yeah, we had it sounds sounds a little more <laughs> professional. When we had that discussion, and we actually went around the table in our meeting talking about horseplay even before this even came, because we all had that thought. The problem is when you look up horseplay, it encompasses a lot of different things, and and it does set a tone for not just because um, conduct and behavior is different than screwing around. And this line is focusing on screwing around. This was it came as a result of screwing around. Where we have I know where it came from. <laughs> so so that was the intent of leaving it as horseplay because it lead because it because it specifically is about screwing off. And people need to be able to screw off. What kind of a especially in this in this occupation, but in any occupation, you've got to be able to have a little fun with your coworkers and screw around and play a joke and play a prank every now and again. Um, I like to prank Carter every now and again. So what, how much fun would our office be if, if, uh, if that wasn't allowed? But there, but there needs to be some reasonable bindings on what is considered reasonable. So I, 
I, I imagine we'll have some discussion about the horseplay word because it comes up everywhere we go. It just seems to encompass what we're looking for, and we couldn't find an alternative that, that still left that feeling. But you're you're in good company with people that are like, meh. I, I, I personally <laughs> like it because I think the word has that connotation mm -hmm. of being something odd or not something you would normally, because the word is kind of strange. Yeah. So to me, when you think about it, if you get in trouble for doing that, you know you were doing something. You know, that something that falls under horseplay is something that probably just, 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 just that could hurt somebody or cause damage. <laughs> Doing it in your car <laughs> with me, of course. Shenanigans. Shenanigans. Yeah, we, yeah, I like that word. We can throw that in there. Yeah, no shenanigans. No, well, minimal shenanigans, yes. as long as nobody gets hurt. Yes, only only harmless shenanigans. Mostly harmless. Right. I have a real world example for you that probably fits in this section, but is not horseplay. So you may want to add another little phrase, as in horseplay and. How do you describe this? You got a sergeant of my acquaintance some years ago who on his retirement evening, his last shift, he's in charge along with several of the rest of us for all of the traffic and safety for San Francisco's 4th of July. The fireworks are done. There's still several hours of keeping that area closed to through traffic so 10, well, 100,000 people can exit safely. This guy picks up his walkie-talkie as soon as the fireworks are done and says, release the barricades, all of them. It was his last official act, and he walked away. Oh, goodness. He thought that was hilarious. Yeah. Some of the other officers thought it was hilarious. 100,000 people caught in mayhem with cars coming through, that's so hilarious. It's not physical horseplay, but it's in the same vein. vein. Yeah. So do we have a problem so so with that sort of thing? <laughs> so he was doing it as a basically intentionally screwing up the poll. Yeah, this is my this is my good ride to the people of San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you're gonna be stuck in traffic for several hours. So yeah. where does that fit? Judgment? Yeah. Professionalism. Yeah. Um, other than the word horseplay, neglected duty that created a reasonable um, possibility of a disruption of operations. Yeah. So I'm just saying. Yeah. You might want to. That, that's. See. It. Okay. Is there is there, is there is there some procedural horseplay place? <laughs> yeah, I still just think that comes under judgment or neglected duty. They have a job to make sure that things are remain safe. He's not playing a trick on a coworker. He's. He's, kind of he's, he's intentionally disrupting the, the safety of the public mm -hmm. for to make to be funny or to, to make a joke, um, but that's uh, but that comes down and again I guess neglect of duty and judgment that that's where that would that, that would come up. Um, horseplay, you yeah, don't right. you don't horseplay you don't horseplay with the public. You don't horseplay with um, horseplay is or shenanigans or amongst friends or coworkers, and so I think. Um, that would be, I think there's all kinds of areas that we, that we could catch somebody. Although if it's on the last day, what are you going to do with them anyway? <laughs> Which is that's why he did it. That's what he did. Yeah, and that's unfortunate because it's unfortunate to leave, leave an agency under that <laughs> cloud of um, differing. And some people probably will think it's funny and a lot of people will think it was ridiculous. And Mercifully, the public could not find out. And I, I wouldn't want to live under that cloud. So. Right, thank you. I just wondered where that sort of thing would fit in this. Yeah, neglect of duty and judgment amongst probably a number of other places overall. Well, and yeah, basically Cubo. Potentially some crimes. Yeah, actually. Depending on how you, if you had somebody that could be creative with the way they worded it. Mm -hmm. So the only other thing in that section that I have is the uh, Wrong for unlawful exercise of authority for malicious purpose, personal gain, and there's a uh, comment that that crosses over with abuse of power, <laughs> abuse of position. Now they wanted malicious defined, and so I believe I moved it. 
in yeah, that suggestion. It's there. So it's been moved to uh, abuse of position of authority, uh, which we already went over, I think. That's pretty early on. Um, and so those are the only other comments that we have on the conduct section at this point. Does anybody have Yeah, more? Steve had one. He, he wasn't he wasn't really happy with suspected misconduct and and it's because the word suspected didn't work for him but uh, would the word perceived misconduct fit in there so we had some discussion about that last time and the problem is the problem is defining at what point something gets reported because yeah. I can think or I could have heard through the rumor mill um, that you've done something but there, but there needs to you got to have something more than that or you're gonna have people you, you start to get into the tattletale realm where you know there may be a lot of individual bias and perception and subjectivity and what is or isn't getting reported um, and even suspected that brings it to a little higher level it just seemed like it um, it brings it to a little higher level of you, you, you've got to have some, if you suspect something, you have to have some evidence of why you suspect it. Um, where perceived, uh, I think just has a kind of a lower threshold. And so that was, that was some of the discussion that we had is that we want to make sure that if somebody believes that misconduct is happening, it needs to be, it needs to be looked at, but it also, they need to have a reason for it and not just a person told B person told C person who told me, and so I now the policy says I have to report it because I perceive or I think that there might be something going on. So that's why we arrived at that. Okay. It's noted in here that the change was made and that there was a concern about it. Um, so. So confidentiality got moved. So I'm. To let everybody know, we have uh, a little less than 10 minutes, uh, about eight minutes left in this section so that we can get to our retreat uh, section. So, you know, I think we, we all knew this policy wouldn't be real quick. And so, uh, so tonight we probably won't get all through this. It doesn't mess up your work plan, Sergeant William. I can, uh, I can work through what we've talked about till now and, and then we can come back. To this has been a, this has been a, long road to get here, so another month is again. Yep. Screw anything up on my end. No so we, and we will have a June, we don't have a July meeting, is that right? So we do have a, so we have a one in July, it's, in, okay, it's August, and I'll be here for both, for both June and July. I have a trip basically smack dab in between them. So there may not be a lot done between two. So we could have everything done, have the comments done by June so that we can go to senior staff and be able to vote, maybe even put more time to make sure that we can get through the whole thing one more time and then and then be able to move it on to the next step would be yeah. fantastic. Yeah, we, we could do that for this. Okay, awesome. I, I've been trying to think why I had a problem with that when we came to, uh, to uh, that particular one that uh, Steve had a problem with was suspected. Yeah. And I think because we deal in precise, big in terms, reasonable suspicion, and I look at the first part of this one said engaging in horseplay creates a reasonable possibility. Everything is based on reasonable, which would be justifiable in the mind of someone who's reporting misconduct or some. So I think maybe inserting, you know, a person that reasonably suspects uh, another person uh, committing misconduct. Uh, reporting that in that way in that way most people could judge whether that was reasonable the way it's written now a person could go with a complaint about suspicion I suspect him of taking bribes well what you know where's your proof well I don't have any proof I'm telling you I suspect him and we're obligated to use resources to investigate that when there may be no basis at all but if you add the word reasonable in there and then people can infer the reasonableness of the complaint, I think we'd be able to justify an investigation into it. Yes, my yeah. So we could, I think, maybe get through one or two more sections. Move 
go on. Uh, so, conduct, you need nothing else from conduct? All right, confidentiality information. I had nothing. There were no changes made. There, were nothing, there was nothing brought up uh, previously. Um, any thoughts now? No? Uh, conflicts of interest. So, So I deleted, there was some discussion about the perception. Uh, somebody just asked if it should be here or not. Uh, it seemed reasonable, you know, having a perception of something. Uh, there was just some, some discussion about what that really means and how that can be misinterpreted. And again, how it, raise, it brings that level down to a really low level. And that really, we don't want people, um, the, you need to have something there. Just because somebody can perceive something out of anything. And so I went ahead and deleted it. That seemed reasonable to me. Uh, and otherwise, well, I guess before we, I mean, I guess, and I wasn't here when that happened, when you had the discussion, but to me, I mean, in, in almost every conflict of interest policy I've ever had or worked under had that perception, because what you, what you don't want is you don't want people to have, you want to look at what you're doing, and if it's, if there's possibly a perception that this could be a conflict of interest, then you shouldn't do it or you should bring that to somebody's attention so somebody can say, you know what, somebody could view that as, as a conflict of interest. So perception, I think, is important in the mind. You, gotta, you know, this isn't just for the public to come in and complain about, but this is for the officer to think in his mind, it, okay, this is, this, would this give a perception? So maybe I need to ask my supervisor or, or that, and I think that's where perception comes into play because we do write this to the public to read it, but we really write it for to help the officer think about these sort of things as they go forward. Oh yeah, it's a guideline for them to know how to how to behave, not just yeah, we so, yet. Yeah, so if they think about well, will that will somebody perceive that? Well, now better ask that question because then then maybe it's fine because the supervisor says no, I don't see that as being a conflict. And then, but if they always are thinking that way, then it could be perception because because even if a the, the public came in and said, well, I perceive that to be a conflict. That could be a problem for, for the person or the department. So I kind of like the perception of that. Uh, Will and then Bob. I had a comment about PE in that section. Okay. When I'm just reading it, I can't imagine the chief of police would authorize anybody to claim that or represent themselves as having personal opinion, which is an official department statement. I can't imagine that he would approve that, approve what it says there. What he would approve, I guess, if anything, would be giving you or somebody the right to represent the department. Yeah, and I'm not sure. I can't tell you exactly where that, where that came it's just from. Odd I don't know the, language. the story behind that. You see what I'm saying, though? Yeah, and I, I don't have an example of what, where that came to be or how that came to be. Okay, that's true. Okay. So then, you know, yeah. then I have Bob and then. So I, for a different. Hang on just one second. Oh, go right ahead. Sure. Right. If I don't take enough notes, I don't know what it said in a week or what I was looking for. Next. Right, go ahead, Bob. I've done that. Um, I, I would like to take a different view on this uh, conflict of interest. I think, again, not to put too fine a point on it, but I, it, it is in legal terms expressed most definitely in most most states, federal, local laws state what a conflict of interest is and everybody knows what it is because it's written in the law and to have a word inserted that makes us totally subjective and i think that's why we asked for it to be struck perception i mean who has to perceive it how many people is one person enough to perceive it to be a conflict and if they complain they think it's a conflict of interest then the officers in trouble because 
you committed what was perceived to be by one person a conflict of interest. Would two or more people be a conflict of interest with perception? How many people does it take to make it a perception? And that's the problem with a lot of these policies is that the police have to decide when they look at it, well, wait a minute, who, who's going to judge me on this and what should I, what should I do? Instead of saying, well, this, this, and this, and this, these are conflicts of interest, and you cannot commit any of these conflicts of interest. And I think without being, you know, to the, to the letter, not to put too fine a point on it, but we need to be giving them the direction and telling them what they can and can't do, and not giving them some concept of what might be perceived by some unknown group as a conflict. And I just realized, I was, I was looking back because I would have sworn that I put the ORS definition in here. Uh, somehow on the way the notes went in, there were there were some parts that were out on the left margin and for some reason those did get left out. So actually in the in the digital copy of this, the definition of ORS 244020 is actually spelled out in here with some comments. Apparently even I can't figure out how to get all my comments to print. Or it's going to shift some, some, some point. Uh, Oregon government ethics law identifies both actual and perceived or potential conflict of interest. Um, and, the, and the difference that they, it, it actually affects public officials. So it's not, it is not directed at police officers, but the distinction between actual and potential conflict of interest is the difference between, in their description, at the uh, online is the difference between would and could so an actual conflict of interest is something that would result in a conflict of interest or potential is something that could so it, it is dealing with a perception of conflict of interest that that, it, that does exist in law for public officials that could be mirrored for police officers for that same appearance of fairness issue um, but doesn't necessarily have to because the state law is only referring to um, public officials. I like potential. Yeah. 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 That's did we did we find a compromise? Potential. Potential is what the state can do. Potential is perfect. Okay. Uh, it, it takes that subjectivity out, but still, but still gets to what I think what uh, what we're talking about. Edward? Going back to B, okay. I think what happened here is that two bullet points got stuck together in one sentence. Because a conflict of interest would be making public statements to media without the authorization of the chief. That's one item. And purporting personal opinions to be official department statements, period, is another item. The chief isn't going to authorize that. So if you take that and make it two sentences and two line items, you got it. Except that I can make a public statement to the media without authorization from the chief. Ever? But you wouldn't purport it to be an official In other words, department? You, you don't have some blanket authorization from the chief to do that? Well, I have, yeah, how would I have to ask you time? Okay, so I guess I don't quite get it. So you're saying attach the, basically stop the sentence at making public statements to the media, period. And, unless and tag, authorized by the police. Unless authorized by the chief of right. police onto it. So that's, then, that's one line. Yeah, except except that I can make statements to okay, it without that. Yeah. I mean, we, we, do, we, do, we do news releases all the time. Yeah. We do, if we're out on the scene and we have to give a statement to the media, that happens regularly. But, but okay. you're not doing that contrary to the wishes of the chief. No. Right. As authorized by the chief. Whatever. I'm just trying to make some sense out of this sentence, which as it's written here doesn't make much sense. There's never going to be a time the chief is going to authorize purporting personal opinions to be official department statements when they're not. He's never going to authorize Yeah, we'll that. certainly take another look at that because I, yeah, I, I see it. I think it's just English put together strangely. And I think there's possibly either or is a mixture of ideas that didn't turn out well and somebody had an idea of what it meant and something. now that we don't know what that meant it doesn't make any sense. Okay. Well I'm told we're in time so I'm going to drop that and let you work it out. Yeah I've got to know that, that we need to look at it so we'll, we'll take a look. So can we, your comment wait till next time well or do you No I need to this time. Real quick though. Okay. I just want to ask about the retaliation section that I suggested at a previous meeting. There's no, I don't see anything in here about retaliation. 
but the I remember commission, commission seemed to agree that that was appropriate. Yeah, but where was that at? Well, there's none in here, but uh, Portland has a very nice section on retaliation. I remember taking some notes on. I don't remember where. I don't know. I don't remember what happened with it. We'll look at, we'll find I, I'd have to. I'd have to take around, and, and we can hopefully address that uh, next time. Okay. Thank you, Sergeant. We appreciate all your hard work on this and being able to take multiple notes on multiple medias and uh, multiple countries. Multiple countries. <laughs> That's yeah, and sorry about my confusion there. It was because I moved the section. So when I was trying to go down one to the next, I somehow spaced that I reorganized a little bit. So we're going to move on um, to our retreat recap. Carter is handing out um, the recap from our Saturday retreat. And so what you will see here is we have 23 items that uh, we came up with that oh, I'm sorry. I thought you got all of them. Yeah, I did. <laughs> sorry, we're still getting there. Thank you. Thank you. Whoops, got it. Got it. Okay. For our work plan for the for the next two years, um, that will start in July. And so one of the things we'd like to accomplish tonight would be that we'd like to prioritize these so that the, the chairman they put together the work plan in each month's meetings. I'll kind of know where the commission felt on what was the high, medium, and low priorities of these 23 items. Um, and so uh, I would be happy since we have some time if we all if we want to talk about any individual item or if we want to clarify what that item means, um, especially for those that may not have been um, at the meeting on Saturday, um, that I'd be happy to do that um, or talk about any of these individual items that we, if we want to uh, or questions about anything. So. Just we just maybe run through them and, and then we have questions as we go. Our, our first one is the use of force, um, de escalation. And then to your right, you see that some of the possible discussion process that we came up with on Saturday review the use of force policies, literature, review current and best practices, things of uh, outside experts. I'm just, I'm sorry, to, to be clear, those are not designed at this point to prescribe what that agenda is going to look like but to provide a little bit more context because two years from now 18 months from now we may not remember what we meant so this is an attempt to at least at this time this is if envisioned this is what that agenda topic might look like and the kinds of things that it might include to give you a flavor and the order is simply the order they came on the sheet and I put them in by the goals that are identified by the city council for the police commission. Okay. So, so are we going to order them within like the first eight out of this first eight? What's the most important, or out of all the twenty-three? Out of all the twenty-three, okay. because they're all under different uh, right headings. And I think all you need is high, medium, low. So okay. we'll just sort them out. Okay. Hi. And so if you feel most of the ones are high priorities, that's fine. You don't have an equal number of high, medium, and low. Okay. So just how, how you feel about that. So, uh, so we'll just continue on. Uh, if we have questions, please stop me. Firearms training and de-escalation um, sort of goes along with one, but we felt that could be a separate topic. Uh, professional police stops policy and bias-based policing. Um, this was a policy that we had worked on a couple of years ago, and so it was brought up to maybe we need to review that and look at that again, and then also look at what maybe is coming out of the pilot program uh, that's been run. Drone policy, uh, again, trying to look, maybe do a lot of 
look at the scope of that policy interest the commission is it something we want to look at to think about the department using and making some recommendations to maybe have a policy to use those or not code of conduct um which we're currently working on we, we know we'll probably still be working on it until next year's Encourage policies and technology that are workforce multipliers. So this was to look at uh, trying to increase the ability of the police force with less people. So turn the police force multiplier, which is actually a common phrase to use. Okay. Uh, next one, review the video policy impact of video and phone recording on police actions policy grade committee process take a look at the, the current process and see if there needs to be policy procedure around that um, and then our next section to uh, change the mentality to a guardian of the police force from a traditional warrior we look at doing some presentations again the code of conduct uh, that being that internal external uh, experts come and talk about that downtown crime enforcement uh, kind of look at that what's happening there stop staffing officers uh, what are they being told maybe look at can't be any trespass policies again that before. Downtown monitoring, uh, look at different ways to, to help with that downtown crime enforcement, whether it's through full circuit TV cameras or volunteer observers, whatever else you look at. Uh, supervisor evaluation and training, uh, again, look more closely into that and, and what maybe other departments are doing or what the city requires uh, we had a presentation on that a few months ago but we can go deeper into that uh, again continue why it's not occurring what resources need to be uh, police legitimacy and procedural justice uh, we're hoping to get a presentation uh, on that a little bit that was again coming from the 21st century policing from the president's report <coughs> uh, review prohibited car camping program and effectiveness again we'll take a, a much deeper look at that than we did last time um, and even look at is there recommendations that we might want to put out to how that program is working societal issues affecting police uh, this was to try to look at more things that uh, affect or the way police are used with uh, different societal issues that are happening. It's more of a holistic approach where the resources may be needed or looked at for for that instead of just relying on the police to enforce laws and stuff. Certain things that doesn't really help. Citations for no driver's license or insurance. Uh, brought up I think it's a human rights commission um, piece that had been brought up about do we look at that look at what uh, the officers can and can't do what things that are allowed so then we go into communications uh, access what public assess what public wants regarding police services including the guardian mentality uh, this is really to find out what the public would like to see in their police department, how they would like them to be and act to do that, and is it the guardian mentality that they're looking for? So there'll be a lot of possibilities with that. Do some more outreach to look at the outreach to minority communities, how the commission could do that, uh, and then also maybe how the police could do that too. Uh, feedback for public, uh, for police response, look at different ways to maybe get information out to the public about uh, the police response times and, and what calls are taking longer or not and why that is. Is that a budgetary resource problem or what? I'm trying to get more into that uh, depth of the, the reasoning behind that. 
uh, address or make recommendations regarding gap between public expectations and the reality, um, which is the, the police department. We had a lot of good discussions about, you know, people, what they expect the police to respond to in timeliness and not uh, out there. And so, uh, and what is realistic based on the budget that we have. Review and recommend policies regarding body board cameras and recommend to city council the resources to implement that. Uh, not all of our officers have body cams, so it's something to look at. Increased police staffing. Again, I think this is having to do with looking at uh, the budget versus what a city of our size resources they would need, typically. And develop a method to increase communication with the city's manager's office and city council. I think that sort of looks at the commission, you know, what uh, what role they play going forward and what that looks like. And, uh, you know, take a, and sort of launch topics for based on that, sort of you know, start to, to communicate more of what we think and you know, with the size of the police force and the resources that it has. So, okay, any questions, any comments on any of that? Uh, if we could take a few minutes and maybe go through and, and do your your priorities on these, we could get them back to Carter so next month we can have those. Scott? Just one thing, um, some of these, we you get know, some work that's ongoing right now. Um, looking at number six, the uh, encouraging policies and technology that work for multipliers in the town, downtown crime enforcement downtown monitoring number 11. Um, where is the police increased police staffing 22 and, and potentially the number 23 there's some work going on now um, that should be done sometime in the, the winter fall time period and then the budget committee is also having the public safety um, service profiles being presented over the course of four weeks so depending on the workload and how you want to prioritize that, there's an opportunity to parallel instead of making a sequential piece. And I was just putting that out there. No, that would kind of be good to find out those those time frames. Bob? I'm, I'm just not clear yet. Are we voting on, in other words, will the number of agents that are placed in the column get the priority? Is that how it works? No, no. Well, it'll, it'll help the, the, the chair people to as they go through the work plan and, and decide that hopefully we'll try to hit our higher priority ones sooner rather than later but but just timing overall that may not always happen but it's just a way of for us to prioritize these going forward uh, for the chairperson uh, to do that next year so they'll know what the commission feels are high priorities versus medium and low priorities so that we can do it but it doesn't mean that we're, we're only going to handle all the ages. No, I, I understand that, but, but I, what I meant to say was, uh, because there's so many, there's 23 on here, and if people feel strongly about almost all of these, they're going to vote high on most of them, and you're going to have still not have the direction that you're looking for. My, my concern is that, you know, we put these out here because they were important to us, each of us, and to pick low priority, to, that, that's not a reality. I don't think we're going to end up picking low priority to more than a few and the concerns on here. So I would like to see the chair and the vice chair set the agenda, which is the way it's supposed to go in the commission and uh, the bylaws. And so I'm going to move that the chair and the vice chair set the agenda for the future meetings based on these concerns that we've shown in our retreat. Okay. Um, I have a motion or a second. I'm not sure I really understand the motion. Mm -hmm. How is that different from what we're doing already? Well, it's allowing you to do what you're doing. And you do it. You're, you make the decision right. about which of these things you think is the priority rather than us giving a little a vote. Speaking right. strictly for myself, I can't speak for Bill, but I would find it invaluable to know what you thought was important or less important. So, uh, yeah. well, so, so I respond to that. So I still have a form. So what I said was, maybe you missed the first part of it, if, if we pick 20 of 23 mm -hmm. as high priority, how will that help you decide which ones to use? 
Well, at that point, I'm tossing coins. <laughs> and that's my point. I think it should be up to, we elect the chair because we, in our infinite wisdom here, decide that that person should lead us through the discussions on these topics. And I think we should leave it to the chair. And my motion may die for lack of a second, but anyway, it's me. Okay. Let, let's, uh, I have Scott in the queue, but um, do we have a second for the motion just so that? Vaughn seconded. it. So we, can so we do have a second. So then I'll open it up for a discussion on the motion. And so Scott, I'm assuming your discussion is going to be on the motion. So, okay. so go ahead, Scott. I, I think that's style versus procedure. I think the chair, if they choose to get the, the feedback again from the panel, I think that's their prerogative to do so. Uh, I, I put myself in the queue. And uh, speaking as the, the current chair, and I'm not sure who will be the chair come July, uh, it would be helpful to me as as you go through this to say that because I, I personally don't think everybody's going to say they're all high because everybody had their own of the three. So I think it would be helpful that the chair to have <coughs> low, medium, and high because you still may get a high and I may throw in a low because we need something to fill that which we can now have the act we do have the ability to bring that specialist in or that person in to do that. But at least I know that of the 23, there's 10 that are on everybody's high list. And so I try to work those in if timing is right. And it's just, I was, we're just trying to help the, the chair people to at least have some reference because we're not sure who that's going to be. So go ahead. something more you want to say? I was just thinking. There's a difference between thinking it's a high priority that we should deal with it and something like number three, this professional police stops policy and the bias policing. It was somebody at our meeting mentioned that could be as much as 18 months before we really get anything. So there's really no point in putting a high priority on this because it ain't happening for quite some time. So I didn't know whether some of the, some of my you know, trying to evaluate whether I think it's <clears throat> high, medium, or low, would be looking at like, oh, well, we don't even have drones yet, or you know, so maybe that's low, but it's really should be high because you know, so that's the thing is it's not the order that we're going to look at them in; it's what's possible mm -hmm. and what's not. <clears throat> and some of that, like Scott just gave some information I don't have about the budget committee is going to deal with these things. So I'm feeling less able to make these determinations without some more information. So that's my, my thought on that. That's all. Well, I think I understand your point, but, but rest assured, even if everyone else around the table put in nothing but H's, I have put in some N's and L's, so that would at least skew the vote that much, and I'm sure that other people have to some degree or other. Um, that's all. So, again, to expand on what um, Terry just said, that was what I was talking about, having the flexibility to schedule this when you can schedule it and to be able to make it a priority when you are. If it helps you understand that some of these things are more important to most of us, then that's fine. But I, I really felt like it should be the chair's prerogative to schedule. Um, if we make number one high priority, and that's all we, we do, I mean, if that's the only one we vote for, then you're stuck with that. But, but suppose Will's uh, um, presentation to us is he's able to do that next next time we meet well now you're stuck with oh well, we got to do this because everybody wants this and all i'm saying is you need to have the flexibility as chair this is my my experience in it end of discussion whatever the vote is the vote is thank you anybody else have any discussion well i just have a question i guess would, would the motion actually change anything other than it wouldn't ask for people to put high, medium, or low on this paper. Okay. That, that's what it's basically the motion is, is saying is that, that we're not going to put that on this. Is that actually what you want, Bob? Is I didn't say that. No, I mean, no, you I can certainly know. still do that. I'm just saying it should be up to the chair, and that alone should not determine because of the fact that it's not statistically accurate in, in that we, we, need to, we need to be flexible. All I'm asking is flexibility. That's all. I misunderstood. Thank you. 
I misunderstood too. That okay. I thought you were, yeah. And my point would be that like the information I shared that you didn't know that this was an opportunity to have that conversation. We, the way it originally sounded is that that was going to be done in a dark vacuum and did not discuss here. So. Okay. Okay. So that clarifies. Okay. So uh, if there's no more discussion, we'll call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? No. Okay. So we have a, okay. Let's go for, for the ayes again and raise your hand for aye. Yeah, well, it doesn't change it. And then, so the against, the no votes, so we have three. Four to three, Gary. Okay, motion passed. We will do that. So, uh, so you can still do your high, medium, and low priorities. Mr. Chairman, is it possible to send this to Steve and allow him to submit it electronically later? Yeah. I, I know he'd appreciate it. Yeah, and we'll get it out to the other yeah. commissioners. Okay, so that wraps us up to closing comments. We're going to have a little early. Do you want to start our closing comments? Uh, right. Yes, if I may. First. Uh, um, so there have been some changes in opioid uh, prescribing guidelines or opiates prescribing guidelines for physicians. Um, they're good uh, overall and reflect current science. Uh, they are quite firm and will be sudden for some uh, patients. I think most people are gonna be better off uh, with the alternatives, especially for long-term pain management, because frankly, we know opioids don't work uh, for a long time in management. Um, some people will avail themselves of the alternatives, but some will seek heroin and non-prescribed prescription medication for them. So um, the docs feel, this is from my civilian, you know, my, my other job, <laughs> uh, wanted to make sure that the police were aware that this was going to be an issue. Um, and that uh, it probably will put some stress on, uh, at least over the short and medium term, on the community resources like drug court and treatment facilities. Um, we also want to uh, stress that uh, many of these people do have some sort of health insurance at this point, and making the connection back to their primary care provider, regardless of the di disposition of their criminal charges, um, is a critical step in making sure that they get access to the resources they need to get back uh, healthy and while well So, thank you. Uh, Mark, let's move here to closing comments. No, I, thanks for allowing me to sit in, and I hope I didn't uh, uh, overdo it. <laughs> Bob? Thank you for the uh, opportunity to look at all this uh, that we've had tonight. I think it's great to have a lively discussion about it and come out with a good compromise on everything. So, thank you. I'll pass. Good. I'll pass. Yeah. That brings me to the subject of passing. I was really uh, gratified by our wading into this policy tonight. Mm -hmm. I think there have been some times in some of the meetings in the past few months where either we're a little overwhelmed by the mass of the work or we're not quite sure what to say about it. So people tend to go around the table and not really weigh in as much as they might. So thank you for just you know, lightening on this one and getting some, I think, some hard work. Appreciate that. Okay, well, I just want to thank everybody. Um, I do really appreciate uh, the discussion on um, all this policy tonight. I think that really, uh, I like when we have that. I appreciate Sergeant Williams uh, taking great notes and, and working through this, and uh, we give you our time once in a while, but we really do appreciate you taking this all back and really working. So I'd like to say that police awards on the 24th is really great to go to. You get to see the fine work that the department does and even the help they get sometimes from civilians. Um, but I think it's important uh, as commissioners to, to go and see the, the positive uh, things that they do. So, Same place and what time? Is that Valley River Inn at right. 3 o'clock? 3 o'clock, um, okay. Look around after the meeting because uh, Marty's making a house of cards out of our name plates. <laughs> Just trying to be nice. Oh, Bring them over. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Have a good night. Shenanigans. No shenanigans. Okay. <laughs> One portion. <laughs> <laughs>